I'm interested sure. in to know like what's the focus of the work group like um, I know like it sounds very broad to say hey, let's do hard, uh, hardware acceleration but do you define the actual uh, goals behind the work group yeah great question uh, and sure uh, so the working group the ROS2 hardware acceleration working group uh, focuses on driving the creation and maintenance of essentially uh, hardware acceleration kernels in a vendor agnostic and accelerator agnostic manner. That mm -hmm. means we make sure to develop the technologies required to enable ROS developers to build computational graphs that leverage hardware acceleration. Uh, technically speaking, we our contributions focus on four key aspects. First, we extend the ROS2 build system to make sure that they can uh, build against and targeting different accelerators. Again, mm -hmm. FPGAs, GPUs from different vendors, but also other accelerators. Uh, and let me make a small parenthesis in here. One thing that people is not so aware about is the fact that modern SOCs, modern chips, mm -hmm. pack a huge amount of accelerators. If you open up the, uh, the schematics of a modern Qualcomm computing system, SOC, you'll notice that they have quite a few specialized accelerators. And leveraging those is really cumbersome. You need okay. to use specialized APIs, and it's definitely far from compiling with GCC or whatever you yes. commonly use. So what we are doing in this working group is, again, just enabling at the build system level the capabilities to uh, go against each one of those. So that is the first contribution. The second contribution is that we don't only extend the build system, we also extend the build tools so that when you call on build your workspace, mm -hmm. actually you can select dynamically against which one of the accelerators you want to go so that you can, by simply using something called ROS mixings, which are extensions to the existing uh, meta build tools, Qualcomm in the ROS world, you can, again, just with a simple uh, argument in the command line, you can go against accelerator A, then B, then C, everything in the same workspace, which just speeds up the development significantly. That's the second contribution. Then there's a third and a fourth, uh, which to keep it simple, we uh, we pack uh, and extract away the complexity of the different frameworks for mm -hmm. hardware acceleration in something called we call sorry a firmware layer, mm -hmm. which allows you to switch between them while remaining agnostic to those technologies to a certain extent. And then the fourth one is uh, building upon prior work. We actually uh, leveraged low overhead tracer for real-time uh, tracing and benchmarking, which allows us to do a performance benchmarking of computational graphs that can be used across various uh, setups using hardware acceleration and without it, which allows us to compare and also device and design improvements. And, and this is crucial. In hardware acceleration, we need to approach the problem with a very quantitative approach. We need to know where we start from, and at every single point, we need to fairly compare various accelerators to know which one is the right one for our use case. Often in the case, we have an intuition, you know, but we want to be very strict and, and quantitative. And actually on this, I can say there is a fifth kind of like uh, contribution that's being cooked. And that is uh, an official formal uh, benchmark in robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something I'm going to discuss in the next upcoming working group meeting. For those familiar with the AI world, you might have heard about ML Commons or ML Perf. That's kind of like the de facto standard right now. Yeah. Uh, so we are creating something called robot perf. And you know, maybe maybe drone perf makes sense, or yeah. maybe it should be part of, well, of robot perf. It should be part of robot perf. We should, as much as possible, try to standardize on robots yeah. because yeah, yeah. we're we're that. already too much further into our bubble that we need to. I, I like back that. To the, yeah, to and, the and that boss. that dives into what you were saying about autopilots, and I I do have some ideas and, and some thoughts definitely that bring me back to when I started working with these technologies back in 2011, 2012, where I had, you know, my disagreement with, uh, with Philip Ross, who, yeah. who was at the time creating uh, PixHawk, yeah. FireCape. The, the 2.1. Yeah. At the very beginning, we were like creating a cape for the BeagleBone Black, so like a hat uh -huh. uh, that allowed uh, to, to run Arduino and Linux. Uh, then we kind of like engaged with Lawrence Meyer at the time, who was driving PX4, and we had some discussions on whether our work on Linux could be brought into px4 so at that time you know from a hardware perspective we, we were having some discussions around how do future autopilots uh should look like yeah. right and I, I i was at the time a phd student and inexperienced but with i guess some pretty strong opinions about what i thought should be doing uh we should we should be doing and those came from the fact that i had worked with ross for many years already mm -hmm. uh, i was pretty early into ross uh, i had contributed to various ross packages 
and was behind also the Meta ROS package, which brings ROS into the Yocto slash Open Embedded World, which is used in production environments. So I, I, I did know quite well the ROS world already, and I, I was sure that, that the, com the convergence was the future about it. And I was looking at it from a robotics perspective, not maybe so from a, a drones perspective. And so I, I always thought that, you know, if we wanted real capabilities, we had to expose some of the autopilot aspects into the computational graph, into the ROS computational graph. And bridges were great, but they weren't performing good enough for us to fully exploit it. And I, I showed this in various tests I conducted and I complained about it. So I started creating my own autopilot that actually had this capability. So technically what this means is that you smash together the autopilot and the companion computer. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, there were lots of critical voices. Like, no, you don't do that due to safety reasons. And I was like, safety? safety. <laughs> I mean, we were working with stm 32 f 4 guys, come yeah. on. Like, if you want safety, just synthesize the PS4 code into an FPGA, into a soft core. And then we can speak about redundancy and having, you know, like, yeah, like redundancy and, and then coherence. At least two instances should, should be agreeing on what to do. Uh, which is, by the way, what happens in commercial autopilots. That's how they are built. And I was yeah. lucky to be involved in, in part of that in some prior experiences. So, so that is the way we're looking at it right now. That's one of the things uh, we're thinking about right now. And, and yes, I was telling you before, uh, with some, we believe, uh, new and novel ideas, which replace the uh, PX4 communication middleware mm -hmm. to try to bring it closer to the Ross world.